Michael Yardney here and welcome again to one of our Rich Habits, Poor Habits webcasts, Michael Yardney in Australia, and welcome on the other side of the world in the United States and New Jersey, Tom Corley. Hey, Michael, how you doing? How's Australia? Great, thank you. We're having our winter and you're having your summer as we record this session. But I'd like to just say thank you for spending the time with me doing these because these are going gangbusters on Facebook, on Twitter, on our own personal blogs. So thank you for all the people watching these as well. And if I could just ask you to spread the word because there's uh, no sales messages here. It's just the, the heartfelt message that Tom and I want to get out to help people change some of their poor habits and get more rich habits. How's it going on your blogs, Tom? Well, you know, I, I have so many uh, hits every day on my blog and I have, uh, it seems to be growing every day. I get emails, probably a dozen or more every day. Thank you for the videos. We love the videos. You know, most, most of what I do, Michael, is writing. So these videos are giving me kind of a, a giving at least my fans a, a different feel for, you know, what I'm talking about. It's just a different way of looking at things when, when you can see someone's face. I agree with you, and it also shows the authenticity. So if we just go back a step, many years ago, Tom, you did a five-year study of the rich habits and poor habits of people, and you came to some conclusions that the rich people have habits that are very different to the poor people. Now, there's nothing that new in this, because almost a century ago, um, uh, it was written in Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill, and even earlier than that, um, secrets of the uh, so, so there was the science of getting rich uh, by Wallace Wattles so we all have been puzzling why the rich keep getting richer and the poor don't interestingly though Tom you've actually done an empirical study and I think that's what's so very different about your research and that's the things we're uncovering in these sessions last week we spoke a bit about changing your goals into habits and one of the ways to do that was associating with people. So I put you on the spot and said, I'd like to discuss this power of association. That's what I'd like to spend some time in this session on, Tom. How important is that? Oh, it's, it's everything. I mean, you know, the fact is uh, uh, there's been a, a lot of studies done on habits. And one of the ones that I highlight on my blog and I talk about often is uh, – a study that was done where the researchers found that habits were contagious. They spread across our social networks. And so that, that means you have to really understand or become aware of your habits because a lot of the habits that you're living every day may come from primarily from your parents but they may also come from your friends and your associations. And, and, and so a good example, I wrote, uh, I just finished a blog article uh, on, um, on this and I was talking about how uh, habits are contagious and how if we associate with people that are overweight, if our parents are overweight, we're probably going to be overweight. Uh, and and what, so what I wanted to, I guess, make, uh, your our viewers and our listeners aware of is that there are so many different types of habits michael you know we have money habits we have health habits we have exercise habits we have thinking habits we have emotion habits we have morning habits afternoon habits we have nighttime ha habits and the people that we associate feed into those habits uh, so if you associate with people in the morning who drink a lot of coffee uh, you're probably going to start drinking coffee. And that may be a good or bad habit. It all depends on the science of the day. You know, science always changes. But uh, so my point is that you really want to be careful about who you associate with because you will pick up their habits if you associate with them probably more than a couple of hours a week, like three or four hours. If you associate with someone that much, you're probably going to pick up some of their habits. Tom, I remember recently I caught up with a young client of ours who was only in his middle 20s and already had two investment properties. He liked investing in real estate and he was a young tradesman. He worked on building sites. You'd call it a contractor out in the United States. 
And he told me that his friends, his mates, as we call them in Australia, were making fun of him. He lived in the western suburbs of Melbourne, which is more a blue collar working class area. And they'd go to the hotel, what we call the pub at the end of the day. And as they were drinking their beer, his friends said, what are you doing spending your money buying investment properties? They were buying cars and doing other things. And he came up to me and he said, Michael, am I right? Am I doing the right thing? My friends say I'm not. And I said, it's no disrespect to your friends, but that's who you're associating with. If you happen to live on this side of the river, if you happen to be going to the hotels here, you probably wouldn't be drinking beer. You'd be drinking something from the top shelf and you'd be discussing stocks and shares and business and uh, investing in real estate. So it really does have a lot to do with your friends and, and the discussions you have, doesn't it? Sure. But, you know, Michael, what your, your circle of friends and your family, uh, when they when they associate with you, they bring with them all sorts of baggage. They bring with them limiting beliefs. They bring with them bad habits. They bring with them uh, thinking that holds them back. And, uh, you know, it's, so you, you're, you know, it's almost an unconscious thing. You're not realizing that they're affecting your life. And this, I have to hand it to your, your uh, friend or your, the individual is a customer or client of yours that they had the awareness uh, to recognize that their friends, you know, were, had different beliefs than they had, different uh, habits than they had. had. And he was wondering what, you know, whether or not he was doing the right thing. So, you know, it was good that he bounced that off of you because most people wouldn't do that, Michael. Most people would just change what they're doing. They would, because if you think about it, the average American, the average Australian, the average person in the Western countries that is watching this has bad money habits. We know that. We know most people don't reach financial freedom, and it's not their fault. They're not taught it by their parents. They're not taught it by their peers. They're not taught it by their schools. They're not taught it by the people they associate with. So if you're going to listen to who everyone else listens to, if you read the things online that everyone else reads, it's going to lead to averageness. And we don't really want to be average. I think we're all aspiring to be better. Uh, and that's, I guess, the things we're teaching. So how do you get around, uh, how do you go about getting new associations, Tom? What's the next step? Well, I always like the idea of um, finding people who, you, you know, I talk a lot about and I write a lot about developing a script of your ideal future life. I, I, that's an important exercise because it helps you form a picture of the person that you want to be, a blueprint for your life. Well, in that blueprint, you, you can find all your dreams and your goals and your ambitions. And so uh, that helps you uh, understand what kind of people you should be associating with. Uh, because you only want, really want to be associating with people who share your dreams, your goals, and your ambitions, and your thinking, who are like-minded, birds of a feather. Uh, so I think that um, if you're going to be successful in life, and the self-millionaires, self-made millionaires in my study uh, all proved this to be true, you have to change your relationships to the relationships of individuals that are like-minded, that share your goals, dreams, and ambitions. If you're not, if you don't do that, you probably, you probably eliminate your chances of success by as much as 90 to, to 95%. Tom, I know that the studies in the United States and similar studies here have shown that the majority of people live from paycheck to paycheck. Uh, they, uh, the money runs out before the month does, and then they go to a, an automatic teller and uh, pay interest on their money to get it in advance. Uh, so poverty habits are very common. And I know that uh, if you associate with a lot of your colleagues at work uh, or friends or family, you're going to find that similarly, they've got bad money habits as well. I think one of the challenges people have though is trying to keep up with the Joneses. Your friend gets a new car, so you have to. Uh, your friend goes on vacation, so you feel you have to. How do you deal with that, Tom? Well, I, listen, you know, you, so I'm supposed to be an expert on this. When I used to drive my daughter to, to her friend's house, uh, the father, 
the house where the father, where he was a, con, a big construction builder. He had this beautiful, magnificent house, Michael. And I would pull up to it and I would immediately feel emasculated. I would say, what the heck am I doing wrong? And then I would stop myself because I had all of this research. And I said to myself, that guy's bitten off more than he could probably chew, which is most of the case. You see some of these big McMansions. I, I would say probably 80% of the time, those people are living beyond their means. So guess what happens to this individual about four years later, 2008, 2009, we have an economic uh, collapse in the United States and, and a lot of the world. He has to immediately sell his huge mansion and he's now living in a small house in South Jersey, not, you know, not even in the nice neighborhood where he was living. Uh, so my point is that yeah, you, can, you can see all of these great uh, people, these people with these great houses and these great cars, and you get envious, and it, it can alter your behavior. Or if you're like Tom Corley, you can say, well, I know that most people live beyond their means and that most people are probably struggling in uh, affording whatever it is, those luxuries that they have. The smart people, Michael, are living below their means. They're, they're living in houses that have uh, small mortgages that they can afford. Uh, and then they get to go on and do diff different things. They get to go and travel. They get to go on vacation. They get to save that money. And then when, when a, an opportunity comes along, they don't have to sell their house. They don't have to move down to South Jersey. They can uh, take money out of their bank account and take advantage of that opportunity because opportunities require um, immediate action, usually. You have to jump on something, usually, if it's a good opportunity. And that's where rich people have an advantage. They get to take advantage of opportunities and they get, uh, because they have the money, they get to take advantage of those opportunities at a discount. Tom, I think what you pointed out was very sensible. It's nothing new about the concept that you've got to spend less than you earn, in save it, and then invest it. And that happens at all levels. So it happens when you're starting at the bottom rungs to start to get an investment portfolio, whether it's real estate, whether it's stocks, uh, whether it's business you want to go into. And even at the next levels, your job as an investor, in my mind, is to build a substantial, a significant asset base until your money's starting working for you. And then you can, you'll have all the money you want. You will be rich and you will be able to um, uh, show off to the Joneses. But it's not necessary to. Um, there's lots of other ways of enjoying life. But I think you've made a really good point, Tom, that we don't need to copy other people because you don't really know what's happening in, in their bank accounts or their checkbooks, do you? No, you don't. And you don't understand the stress that they're under in trying to keep up that facade of uh, the, you know, successful lifestyle. Uh, you know, a lot of the successful people, Michael, they go, they're below the radar. Very much so. And unfortunately, one of the things that happens when people get a raise, they get more money, uh, they, they tend to change their living habits. They tend to change their lifestyle. They tend to understandably want to get rewarded a bit but uh, what happens is if you look back to what you earned five years ago ten years ago which may have been considerably less than today you probably had difficulty making ends meet and those people today now that they're earning substantially more are still having difficulty making ends meet so some of the things that you and I write about in our blogs are critical to understand also the importance of um spending less than you earn and having a long-term focus because if you invest early and accumulate and let the benefit of compounding and, and leverage and time work, uh, you're going to have uh, great golden years if you get older. On the other hand, if you like the average American, the average Australian, you're going to uh, be looking for your family uh, or, or the government to look after you. And uh, I'm not sure the government's going to be able to afford it in our country. Tom, how's it going in the United States? Well, you know, it's, it's really not going well at all. I mean, the, you know, the, the fact is, that um, I think close to 80% of retirees um, rely entirely on Social Security in the United States. And just to give you, just to give us some context, uh, the average couple, that, that's a husband and wife that are still alive, they might be making about $40,000 on Social Security. Now in the United States, it costs you, it, I don't know many places in the United States except maybe 
you know, in the square states, we call them, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Iowa, Idaho, you know, where nobody lives. Uh, I, don't, I don't know that um, anybody can get by on less than $3,000 a month. So, you know, it's, a, it's a expensive living here. And I think uh, the fact that so many people do not prepare for retirement, uh, they have no choice but to lean on their kids and that's disastrous, Michael, because it completely changes your relationship with your children. Now, they don't look at you as mom and dad. They look at you as a burden. When they get that phone call from you, they're not saying, oh, good, it's mom or dad. They're, they're, they're saying, oh, God, what do they want now? Interesting that you say that. It depends culturally, of course, because if you go to Asia, if you go to many underdeveloped countries, that's the only financial plan people have, having lots of children but hopefully in our more modern Western societies, what we're going to do is look after our own future by investing. So in this session, we started to talk about uh, the power of association and we got a little bit sidetracked, but I love having these chats with you, Tom. So just to bring it back to the point of, if you want to develop rich habits, if you want to develop successful habits, Tom's suggestion, my suggestion is to associate with people who are like the sort of person that you want to be, whether it's in health, whether it's with regard to money, whether it's with regard to relationships, you can find them in associations, in clubs, in sporting organizations. You can get mentors. Some of them are mentors that you've never met, like Tom and me that are online. Others are mentors that you're going to end up paying for. Wealthy people pay for their advisors. Poor people get it all for free, but that's the advice, the value of the advice they sometimes get as well. And you can get it from mastermind groups. And I know that my thinking changed when I learned about this concept of mastermind groups in Think and Grow Rich in Napoleon Hill's book. And my first mastermind group was actually a group of people, Tom, sitting in Giorgio's restaurant in Malvern every Thursday morning. And we'd each read a chapter each week of uh, Think and Grow Rich. And it was sort of a book club, but we actually unpacked it. And it was really interesting to see how other like-minded people saw things very differently, but it was very stimulating, Tom. Well, you know, if you're, that's, that's so, such a good point because, you see, when you're associating with people that are trying to achieve the same thing and trying to grow the same way, uh, it actually has a significant impact on your life because it's all positive reinforcement, Michael. You're not getting any of this negative feedback. You're getting only positive feedback. And that's what, what self-made millionaires in my study, that's what they were looking for. They weren't looking for yes people, don't get me wrong. They wanted people to give them honest feedback, but they weren't looking for people who had negative outlooks. They were looking for people with positive outlooks that could, um, they could you know, share something in common, and that was a pursuit of some common goal or dream. Tom, thank you very much for this time again. We started all this a couple of weeks ago where we started to unpack your success habits, your rich habits, and compare them with the poor habits. So over the next couple of weeks, I'd like to spend some time going through those with you. Maybe we can list them, talk a little bit about them, and then in subsequent weeks, we can dig deeper into each of those. So can we have another chat this time next week? Oh, I can't wait, Michael. I love these chats. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Tom Corley. Thank you.